Our next guest has spent the last several decades fighting for indigenous people's rights, economic justice, LGBTQ rights. She's protested war, she's fought for gender equality, and so much more. Now, she's actually devoting herself to the climate emergency via Fire Drill Fridays. It's a national movement to protest government inaction on climate change, and she has her own personal climate pact. She continues to fight always for the most vulnerable among us. She's consistently pointing out the intersection between all these myriad of causes. I'm so excited and so honored and so hyped for this conversation. Please welcome my dear friend, Jane Fonda. Hi. You're so glamorous and sophisticated. Are you I always. Oh, I haven't seen you in so long. It's been a while. Jane. I'm so happy to see you. I'm happy to see you. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for asking me. Do you know this is the first time that I've had some, this is our third season, but this is the first time that we've had a repeat name for a street. Um, so I'm going to ask you, you can either tell me your superhero name or your porn name. Do you have a preference? I, what does that mean, my porn name? <laughs> so your porn name, which is like imaginary what your porn name would be, is the name of your first pet and then the street you grew up on. My first dog was a Dalmatian named Buzz. Buzz. Mm -hmm. And then the name of your the street you grew up on is? Tiger Tail. Buzz Tiger Tail. That's actually a great porn name. It is? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> My mom's What is was, your porn name? Mine is Trick Pugsley. Because I had two hamsters trick and treat, and I grew up on Pugsley Avenue in the Bronx. Tell me about your house on Tiger Tail. It was during the Second World War. My father was overseas. Mm. But he designed the house, and it was a Dutch farmhouse. Mm. He bought nine acres. This was 1939. Nine acres at way at the end of Tiger Tail, and then the paved road stopped and it was a dirt road. So we lived on a dirt road and there were no other houses around. Wow. And, um, and, and that's where I spent the first 10 years of my life. And do you remember a lot about the house? Absolutely. My father was Henry Fonda. He was an actor. He won a, an Academy Award for On Golden Pond, mm -hmm. which I which produced. Which you were in and, with him. And produced. Mm -hmm with Bruce Gilbert. And anyway, my dad was obsessed with early America. Furniture, fabrics, log houses, things like that. So this Dutch farmhouse was, was like early American, all the furniture, the wood, they were all antique from early American times. Mm. My bedroom had a braided rug, which was very early American, and a, a, an antique little four poster bed with a canopy like that and and um, a quilt that was like an early American quilt. There were paintings on the wall that looked like, oh, I can't remember the name of the artist, but very kind of early American. Americana. Kind of Americana, yeah. And, um, you know, the it was chintz and antique early American furniture that I grew up with. Huh. When you dream about it, is it a pleasant memory? There were air raid warnings. Everybody had in those days black curtains that you would put up over the window and you'd have to turn off all the lights. And my brother and I would hide under a table, you know, until the air raid siren was like, gave the okay sign. So there was a lot of fear and there had been submarines, Japanese submarines sighted off, off the coast. And in I California. Yeah. And my mother and father would be among the volunteers that would go out at night to, to search the for skies planes. for bombers. Yeah. Wow. So there was there was a lot of and there was you know the media played up racism a lot. Mm -hmm. You know the way we talked about and thought about Japanese people. You know it was just not good. So there was a lot of scary mm. feelings. But on the other hand, since I was an absolute tomboy. There was all these beautiful hills and canyons and caves and places to explore. Were so, you outdoors around the house a lot? Not around the house. I would, no. I mean, I can't even see where I used to go because there's so many houses there now. I go back mm. to try to find the property and there's so many houses on it that it's hard to know exactly where it begins and ends. But I, I was always out exploring nature. Yeah. So the house was surrounded by woods. 
was surrounded by, well, you know the way the hills of California look. They're beige mm. and rolling and very feminine with live oaks mm. dotted from here. It, that was, it was like beige. Lush, but. And then there were, there were nine California oak trees on mm. it. And I climbed them and that was what I spent my time doing. Wow. Okay, who lived in this house? Well, my dad was away most of the time. My mother, my brother, me, um, our governess. Mm. And it's very sound of music sounding, your governess. I was raised by a governess. Okay, it was during the Second World War, food shortages. Everything was being sent overseas to support the troops. So we were asked all, you know, Americans, North Americans were asked to grow victory gardens. Um, so that we could su supply our own food and not feed yourself. Feed ourselves. We had rabbits. We had, we had chickens. My mom would cut their heads off and kill them. And did you have rabbits that you were raising or wild ate. rabbits? No, we ate them. Yeah. And we ate the chickens and we ate the eggs and, and you know, it was it was okay. Yeah. Did you feel? I mean, growing up, do you feel like you had a sense of mortality or that like the circle of life and nature because you were with these rabbits and these chickens and they came and they went or were you heartbroken when they were killed to eat? Or no, I never got I never was I never got attached to them. I would now I wouldn't be able to do it now. But no, I, I would. You know, we also had I mean, I every night of my childhood, I went to sleep to the sound of coyotes. Mm. They were my friends. They were bobcats and mountain lions and. All kinds of things. It was now we get so excited when we see that stuff in LA because it's so rare. Yeah. It was it was pretty great. Yeah. But there were only two billion people in the world then. There are eight billion people now. So Is there was a true? lot of empty space. Um, there wasn't traffic. There were no freeways. There was no smog. Um, you know, Westwood was. Now Westwood has tall skyscrapers. Then nothing could be above two stories. So it was a real village. Wow. It, was, it was very different. It took hours. I had an uncle that had a gas station in Van Nuys. It took two hours to get to the valley. You went through the Sepulveda Tunnel, and when you came out, it was all trees, orchards, wow. avocado and citrus, not like now. It was different. What, was the, what were the sounds of your house growing up? Was it a sound of... Silence. Really? Yeah, it was, there wasn't very much laughter or anything then. It wasn't until later, but yeah, it was silent. It uh, was dark, um, except that there was a swimming pool and there was a house that was next to this, a small house. And that was where my dad, house. when he was home, there he would go to drink and play cards with his buddies and mm -hmm. he would play Nat King Cole. He was obsessed ah. with Nat King Cole. Huh. And so that is... It's back in that other house where my father went, where the sounds of Nat King Cole. Every time I hear Nat King Cole, I'm you taken back to then. Yeah. yeah. Was there laughter in that house, in that in the pool house? Um, not when I was there, but I was kept out of the nighttime stuff. With they played a game called, I can't remember what it was called, but they all they wore holsters with pistols, and they'd all put them. I mean, it was put them on the table. Really? I, yeah, I mean, I never was around for that. They never let me, but dad would talk about it. Wow. And it was it was John Wayne, John Ford, Ward Bond, Burgess Meredith was all those guys. Yeah. What were that's amazing. And then my best my father's best friend was Jimmy Stewart. And Jimmy Stewart had become a war hero flying uh, airplanes over England to try to shoot down the Nazi planes that were bombing England. And he would come home on leave and he would come to our house. He was a bachelor mm. and he would sleep in a little tiny playhouse with all the cats. It smelled bad. <laughs> but I'll never forget Christmas. One Christmas when he, he was home, Jimmy Stewart was. And in this your was home. Hmm? In, your in home. my home, mm -hmm. in our home on Tiger Tail. And um, it was the first Christmas when I knew there was no Santa Claus. And if your kids are watching, turn it off. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, dad had Jimmy Stewart pretend to be Santa Claus. And oh. at night he went up on the roof with big cowbells and ho, 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 
and ring the bells and run across the roof. And my brother thought he was younger than me. Oh, my, there you go, Santa Claus. <gasps> what and a then treat. There was always a lot of eggnog drinking. My mm, dad loved spiked, good a lot spiked of eggnog. bourbon in his eggnog. Uh -huh. And he, the decorating the Christmas tree was always the big deal. He loved Christmas and he loved the Christmas tree. And he taught me how he would get a bucket and it was just, it had to be a certain amount of Lux soap flakes. You're too young to even know what that is. What are those? And water. Well, there would be a box of, you know, like there is Tide yes. today, but it was Lux. It was like a powder Lux. soap. And it was like, yeah, yeah. kind of like flakes. Detergent, yes. Flakes. yes, yes, yes. And they, he had just the, uh, the right ratio of soap flakes in the water and an egg beater. And he would beat it until it would become stiff foam, and he'd put it on all the branches of the so Christmas it tree. it like snow. Yeah, he'd put snow on the tree. And he, he'd spend hours, He wonderful decorations and things like that and 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 they realized that they hadn't put the star on top oh no and so jimmy had to get a, a ladder <laughs> and climb up and because of the eggnog he fell into the tree <laughs> oh no the tree over. so that was that was a memorable christmas wow and to this day because of my dad and his love for christmas and the fact that he was always a little bit tipsy with eggnog so he was always in a good mood at Christmas. Mm. So Christmas to me is very important too. And I have a 14 foot tree that I, I have 40 years of collected ornaments. I was going to say, do you have more. ornaments from when you were a kid still? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You do. And then you've collected them, gathered them through the years. Yeah. Wow. Is there a favorite? I have a favorite ornament from our tree. Um, there are German wooden angels playing mm trumpets are on yeah those are my favorite because they really do go back to my childhood i have a lot of favorites though i mean i i just love taking them out every year they're like old friends yes and there's many of them i made myself so it's mm. it's, it's always good were there other big holidays in your home yeah. i don't know i mean when we were very little my dad was a, mostly away at war mm -hmm. um and he would come home occasionally he usually came home for christmas but I don't remember too much celebrating. And my mother had a mental illness, so not much went on. Yeah. Did you, were you afraid for your dad when he was away at war? Did you know what that meant? No, I was afraid that we were going to be attacked. You know, we could stand outside our house on the top of the hill and look down over the glistening Pacific. Mm. And so it was like they were going to come up from the sea and come up the hill. Mm. And Those were the stories everyone told. That, that was that what, was the what I imagined. Danger. And yeah. I would climb up to the top of the oak tree and I would imagine that I led an army. You were fearless. Hmm? You were fearless. Kind of, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That hasn't changed. <laughs> and I wanted to be a boy and I wanted to be an Tell indigenous boy. Tell me why not, right? I can see your face. I, I mean, my dad, that was the star that I wanted to hitch my wagon to. You know, my mother was, you know, you're little. You don't know exactly why, but you know that there's something wrong. Mm. Something must have happened when she was young. Mm. And I knew that she didn't really love me. And, and, and she was bipolar. I didn't, you know, that wasn't the identity that I wanted. Mm. Seemed to me like men were the survivors. They had the power. And, and, you know, if, if I had to choose, I wanted to be a strong survivor. The rugged individual. You want to be a rugged individual. You want to... The sign of maturity being grown up was you could do it yourself. That you self-reliance. Totally self-reliant. Were there foods that you loved growing up in that house? When you think about that house on Tiger Chair, were there any meals or treats that you enjoyed or... On Sunday, I could, the governess would give us, everybody had the day off, the governess would, we could eat shredded wheat with thick cream and sliced bananas. And that was a real treat. Mm, yeah. <laughs> because even though we had a victory garden and fruit trees and it's California, we ate canned fruit. Why? My mother, I don't know. Yeah. And we ate spam. Mm. <laughs> My dad's favorite. 
<laughs> spam and the butter was they would because butter was rationed. Yes. So you'd you'd buy this plastic thick plastic bag of Crisco, which is lard, that had about a marble a big marble size plastic container that had orange coloring in it. And you would, and my job was always to squeeze it so the so color- So that the butter would look more like would, butter? So that the Crisco would become the color and it would end up looking like butter. Wow. P you know, people would wonder why in the Fond of House do you eat canned fruit? Mm. It didn't make sense, but that's the way it was. Mm. Was your governess a good cook? Um, there was no good cooks anywhere. The food was not good. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. When you left home, were there, any, were there any things that you missed about it? My father had been in the Navy and he came back and then he went to Broadway with a play called Mr. Roberts. Mm. And they knew right away it was going to be a huge hit. It played for four years. He never four missed one years? performance, not one performance, for this four years. This is when years. you were 10? Huh? That was when I was 10. And okay. we, we flew. I'd never flown at night. We flew. And you couldn't fly across the country at night then. I'm talking about the late 30s, early 40s. You, could, you, could, you flew to Omaha. You slept on the tarmac in <gasps> bunks. The, what's now overhead for baggage were bunks. And you would sleep on the plane. It was like in a bunks. train. How huh? you sleep on a train in the. It was like a train, but yes. it, it was like an upper bunk at a train, yeah. And then you f flew to New York. We arrived at night. We went to Broadway. I'd never seen a skyscraper or lights that looked like they were floating. I remember Times it was, Square. oh my God. It's like opening a jewel box or something. <laughs> went to the theater where he was playing. I just remember watching him walk out on stage and the roar from the audience. Mm. And I knew why we'd lost him. We'd lost him to the theater. I mean, this was the world that he loved. And, mm. and it was, I don't know, I just thought it was exciting. You could feel the energy of what oh. he was getting from the audience. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. Mm -hmm. And then we drove out to Greenwich, Connecticut, where they had rented a house. We went to school there. And... Um, Whereas my brother was completely distraught from about leaving California. I mean, really acted out a lot and wrote on the walls of the house, you know, I want to go back. And I was just fascinated. The first morning I woke up and I opened the curtains and looked out. I, you know, I'd never been in the East Coast. Yeah. And it was like, oh, my God, there's more green than in my <laughs> colored pencil kit. It was it just blew my mind because yeah. I love nature. Yes. And it was a big property with a lot of swampland and forests and it's all gone now. But I was ecstatic. Mm. The woman that my father married after my mother passed was Oscar, Oscar Hammerstein's stepdaughter. So I mm. got to know Oscar Hammerstein too. Wow. She was Jewish. Okay. Beautiful. And she laughed and danced mm. and was like everything that had never happened in our family before. Suddenly there was light and laughter and, and jokes. And, <gasps> and, I, and then I met Sidney Lamette and he also oh. was always laughing. And I said, it's Jewish. <laughs> we have to bring more Jewish people into this mm. home. They bring laughter. And, it's resilience and, and she survival. Had African American friends. Mm. And for the first time I, be, I got to know like Jeffrey Holder, mm. who I now real I always thought of him as a dancer, but somebody just gave me a book that he signed to me before he died of his artwork. He was a mm. great artist, Jeffrey Holder. Wow. Is it because you just you weren't books. really around black people when you were living in LA or No, I wasn't at all. Yeah. Not exposed to people of color at all. Mm -hmm. I didn't know racism until I went to Greenwich. That was the first time I ever heard the N-word, and I repeated the N-word once, and the only time in his life that my dad's whacked me really? across the face. He said, don't you ever, ever say that word again. Oh, mm. my God. Mm. Um, my dad grew up in Omaha, Nebraska. And one night, he was, I don't know, maybe 12, 
His father said, come with me. His father, my grandfather, who I never knew, had a printing press that looked down over a central plaza, a square in Omaha. And he made my father stand there and watch when a black man was taken out of the sheriff's office and hung and then dragged behind a truck around the square. And it had a huge impact on my father. And he made the Oxbow incident about hanging. He made the wrong man. He made 12 angry men. I mean, he really, he cared about justice and he hated racism. And, you know, with that slap, he taught me to pay attention. And so, and there were kids that weren't allowed to play with me in Greenwich because my, I came from a theatrical family and we were supposed to, like it was contagious, hmm. you know, divorce and stuff like that. No, couldn't play. So that was when I realized, oh, I'm different. Hmm. And then I, you know, then after my mother, committed suicide. I moved in with my father, who was now with somebody else in, in New York. So, you know, New York is busy. I don't know. You're just, <laughs> it's a lot going on. Your dad had such a mind toward justice. And yeah. like I, I was very moved hearing about the slap and, and what he witnessed as a child, because I just know I know what he poured into you. In 2000, when I started writing my memoirs called My Life So Far. It's so good. Her memoir is so thank good. You. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you. Um, I was writing about my parents and the phone rang. I was on my ranch in New Mexico, which I, I don't have anymore. I loved that ranch. It was ranch. Martin Luther King's, one of his daughters, mm -hmm. who was a friend of mine. And I don't remember why she called me, but I suddenly, I, said, I asked her, I said, Listen, did, you, did your father ever like put you on his lap and talk to you about values and how to live a good life? And, and she said, no, he never did. And I said, you know, and my dad never did either, never talked to, talk to us about how to live and what good values were. But I said to her, you had your father's sermons Mm. And I had my father's films, mm. and that was how they taught us. Mm. You know, there's all kinds of different ways to teach kids. Yeah. And we both recognize that even though we never had that direct fatherly love kind of touchy thing, we had a lot of messages. Mm. Yeah. Mm. It's so interesting because you know, throughout the years, I met you first in activism work, working with V-Day together. And I feel like you've spoken out uh, for so many people, for so many causes. But I know the thing that you're working on most now is climate change and the environment. And when you talk about Tiger Tail or even your time on the East Coast, it's this deep, deep connection to nature that started so early. So yeah, fascinating. And the ocean, I mean, I spent with my brother every summer at the Santa Monica Beach. Mm. I mean, that was my life, swimming in the ocean. And, you know, when I read now that hundreds of thousands of dead fish washed up on the beach in Miami where the ocean is 101 degrees, I mean, it's just hard. It's devastating. And the way I avoid despair is that I... I'm doing everything that I humanly possibly can so that we stop burning fossil fuels and we rein in the climate crisis. Mm. Where did you learn that? Where did you learn that the way out of despair is action and activism? Four years ago. Four? No, because you've been doing that a long time. I know, but I didn't, I have never in my life gotten as um, yeah. really dis. Despairing. Going down a rabbit hole of despair. When the fires were all burning in Northern California and not far from here, and the sky in Los Angeles was orange brown. Yeah, it was like a And birds were movie. falling dead out of mm. the sky. And it was 112 degrees, and I was beside myself. And that was when I decided to go to Washington and raise a ruckus. And it became Fire Drill Fridays. Well, you we would engaged get arrested in. Arrested every week. 
civil disobedience every Friday. And the minute that started, my despair lifted. And, you know, optimism is saying, everything's going to be fine. Don't worry about it. But you don't do anything to make it so. Mm. Hope is a muscle. Mm. Hope is you're going to fight for something no matter what you think the outcome must be because it's important to do it. Mm. And, um, you know, Greta Thunberg, who for me is very inspirational, she said, don't go looking for hope. Look for action and hope will come. Mm. And she found it out very early in life. Mm. Yeah. If there was one thing from your childhood growing up on Tiger Tail that you could bring back into your life now, what would it be? There'd only be two billion people in the world and there'd be no freeways and no smog. Mm. And I'd live surrounded by wilderness and nature. Mm. And I would ride horses. Mm. Mm. And what would you say to that little girl on Tiger Tail Road if you could go back and whisper something in her ear? Don't give up. It's going to get better. Don't give up. You're okay. You're worthy of being loved and you're going to be okay. That's what I would have said to her. Mm. I love doing these interviews because I feel like it's so important to affirm that every single one of us is the lead character in the story of our lives. That mm. we're not, we can choose to be the co-star, but we always have the capacity to be the hero of our own journey. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you think about the story of your life, if I was to start with once upon a time, how would you finish that sentence in the story of your life? Once upon a time, there was a little girl born and they named her Lady, Lady Fonda. And she discovered all on her own that she didn't want to be a lady. And so she changed her name and fourth grade class. My name is not Lady. My name is Jane. And that's what I want you all to call me. And she grew up, in spite of everything, pretty resilient. At an important point in her life, she decided that she was going to live very intentionally, that instead of being taken by the current in a canoe with no oar, she's going to put an oar in the water and steer her own boat. Mm. It's beautiful when I think about how much fear was poured into you as a child, right, in those drills and the fear of the Japanese coming in and, and to be at a place in your life where you, I mean, you've been such an example to people of not giving into fear and of, of rejecting xenophobia and of embracing people that are different from you and choosing compassion. So I'm so grateful that you've had that arc to be able to give us an example. Yeah, I feel... I was going to say, I feel really lucky. I'm grateful for that. But Oprah says, luck is, is opportunity meeting preparation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and I prepared mm, yeah. to become a lucky person. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Thank you for sharing with me so much about Tiger Tail and your journey. I'm so proud of you. <laughs> <laughs> Everything you do, it's just... A joy. I love you. Thank you for doing this. I'm so grateful you asked me. Thanks, Carrie. I yeah. love you, too. <laughs> Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you so much to Jane Fonda for being a guest on Street You Grew Up On. I loved being able to hear her talk about her childhood and about sisterhood and coming together in community for the greater good. That is so much of what we're working toward on Street You Grew Up On. If you are loving this series, please continue to spread the word. Make sure that you like and subscribe. Thank you to all of you for tuning in. Thank you to all of our amazing guests. Thank you to all of our incredible crew members. Um, we're so grateful that you're a part of this community. If you wanna know more about the street that I grew up on, you can grab my memoir, Thicker Than Water. And if you wanna learn more about our guests, just keep watching and rewatching and tell us who you wanna hear from in season four, because hopefully we'll be back for more street you grew up on. Thanks.